All right, guys, welcome back to another video. So in this one, we're we'll building a fairly simple and small dresser. Now, the idea behind this project is for one, it's not super expensive. I'm on a pretty tight budget right now, so building this slightly smaller dresser is gonna be very helpful uh, to kind of keep things a little bit more affordable. The other part of this is I wanna test out a new technique for staining, which you guys are gonna see later on in this video. But for the design of this small dresser, I decided to base it off of the side cabinet I built a few months back because I really liked how kind of simple and clean that design was and how well it worked for the staining that I did on that project. So we're starting off with the post legs here and I'm just making sure I take my time to make them as accurate as possible. One of the things that I've found over the few projects that I've done is that I love working with post leg construction because it does make the overall project very easy because you're working off of these very strong and stable legs that then everything else is kind of tied into for added strength. Now the one important thing to consider when dealing with post legs is the orientation in your grain. Now because we are going to be staining these later on in the video, we do lose out on some of the visual characteristics of that grain, but it's still very important that you take the kind of time to consider it. You want to make sure that you have either quarter or rifts on grain on those legs and that your straightest grain is always on your front two legs. Now another consideration for this project was the size of the joinery, and I know that sounds kind of strange, but typically speaking, when I'm working with three quarter thick stretchers or these one and a half inch thick post legs, I can usually stick with a quarter inch tenon and I know that that'll be just fine. But for this project, because I'm working in hard maple, I upscaled all of my tenons to three eighths of an inch because I know on my mortiser, my three eighths chisel bit and the, the auger bit that's in the middle of it is a lot stronger than the quarter inch one. I've actually broken the quarter inch one multiple times on past projects. So for this project, I wanted to avoid doing that because I knew it would take me a long time to get a new auger bit. So by going with just slightly larger joinery, that helped me save that hassle. And that's one of those things you really have to consider when you're working with a wood like hard maple. I don't work with maple often. I do plan to work with it more often now after figuring out the staining process, but it's a wood that I've avoided in the past because it is very challenging to work with. It's one of the densest and hardest woods that's available, and it will be a challenge if you've never worked with it before. The key to working with hard maple is just making sure that your tools are as sharp and as tuned up as possible. Because if you're working with dull tools, you're gonna get bad results every single time. Now the one thing that did surprise me about working with this hard maple on this project was how easy certain pieces were to work with hand tools. Now I had always kind of sworn off hard maple for doing anything with hand tools because it is such a tear out prone wood. But if you take the time to choose your pieces very specifically, it is actually quite easy to go through and use a very sharp hand plane for all of your finishing work. And hard maple, because of its hardness, is one of those woods that just finishes so beautifully with a hand plane. And you can get these really nice, thin shavings that are just so enjoyable to work with. So as we build up the side structure here, you can see that these cross pieces that I'm using for the top and bottom, I'm bringing in that same design style that I used on that side cabinet, adding in that heavy bevel. And what I really like about this design style is just the fact that it kind of tapers from those post legs into that thinner overall side panel that we're gonna be building later on here. But one of the problems that I have started to kind of find myself running into is that I have found a way of building these pieces of furniture that works really well, but the problem with that is I've been kind of using that as a crutch. And kind of looking back at this project as I'm working on the video and kind of seeing it in its final form, I love the way that this piece of furniture came out, don't get me wrong. But one of the things that I would really like to do going forward here is maybe get a little bit more creative with my design style. But the one benefit that I have found you kind of using this same design style repeatedly is that I've gotten fairly good with it. Now in this project, I did a really good job of paying attention to my joinery and making sure to go through and tune it up each time with my block plane here. Now this did take a lot of effort because obviously you're going through and adjusting every tenon individually, but it allowed me to get this just perfect fitting joinery that it was really fun to put together because everything basically held its structure without any glue. For the side panels, this is where we're gonna include some natural cherry. Now you guys know this has kind of become a favorite design style of mine where I mix and match the stained wood with some natural wood. I love the way that this just makes the natural wood pop. But for these side panels, I wanted to do something a little bit special. So I've had this really wide piece of cherry in my shop for months now. I don't know when I bought it, it's just been sitting here for months. 
And the problem that I ran into with it is it wasn't quite what I wanted. I really wanted to have a slat structure to those side panels just because that was the look that I was going for. So what I decided to do is I took this really wide piece of cherry, broke it into three individual slats, but I made sure to keep them in sequential order when I actually put everything together. This kept it so that we ended up with what looked like a solid piece of wood because we had that consistent grain flowing across, but we still had all that depth and definition that comes from that slat structure. This took a lot of time and effort to just make sure I wasn't going to screw up, and especially when it came time to do the glue up, I really had to pay attention to where I was putting the pieces. But as you guys will see in the final product here, it was absolutely worth the effort. I think it makes an amazing difference to that side structure because of the amount of effort that went into it. And this is one of those things that can really take a, a really good project and kind of take it up a notch. Because what ends up happening is you go from having a fairly basic or simple side panel, you know, I could have made all these slats just from individual pieces of wood, but by making sure that that consistent grain is flowing across all three pieces, it just elevates the piece ever so slightly and makes it just look that much better. Moving on to the cross structure, this is where the project started to get a little bit stressful because I realized that I was going to be making things very complicated for myself later on. But what I'm going to be using on this dresser is a traditional style of making drawers where each drawer ends up sitting on its own frame and that's what supports the drawer. So that means that each level of drawers needs their own frame. And because I was going to be going this route, I knew that I could get a little bit creative with my drawer setup. So basically what we have here is five individual drawers and then two of those drawers are going to be split in half. This just gives us a little bit more justification as to why we're using these different frames for each level. And it just overall makes the front of this dresser look a little bit more interesting. Now the one problem that I did figure out very early on with these frames is that in order for the drawer to slide nicely on these frames, after everything is glued up, those pieces need to be as flush as absolutely possible so that the drawer is not going to get hooked up on anything. So I started by making the, the stretchers that are going to go from one leg to the other, just kind of defining our front and our back. Now this clip perfectly exemplifies why I was starting to get a little bit stressed out because as you can see there's a lot of tendons that have to be matched into those mortises all while glue is slowly starting to cure up later on in the project. But this is also kind of an exciting point because we finally get to see the structure of this thing starting to come together. And the final piece of the cross structure is our top stretchers. Now whenever I'm doing post legs I always do my top stretchers with half line dovetails. This just helps prevent the top portion of the of whatever it is you're building, whether it's a dresser, a table, doesn't really matter. Just helps it those tops of those legs from pulling apart because you have that mechanical advantage of the joint to help hold everything together. Now, the only downside to this joint, obviously, is that it has to be hand cut. There really is not a good way to go through and cut this by machine because there's not really any way to hold those post legs in a jig or anything like that to use a router. So it always has to be hand cut, but it's also really not that hard. Because these are not going to be a visible joint, you can kind of make the crappiest dovetails you've ever seen. Now when I do them on these legs, they came out okay. There was One of them was a little bit loose, but the other three were all pretty decent. And when you actually go through and put things together, it really doesn't matter whether or not they're beautiful. The only thing you have to watch out for is you want to make sure your shoulder line on the front stretcher is as clean as it possibly can be. So really take the time on that one singular spot to, to make sure it's as nice and as clean as you possibly can make it. And from there, the rest of your joint will look just fine. And this is a really good place. If you're ever worried about doing dovetails or you just want to get some practice in, this is a great way to do that practice because you're going to be cutting dovetails. You're going to need to spend the time and effort to get those half line dovetails right. But it's also in a space that is never going to be seen. So if they're bad, then they can be bad and no one will ever know. And you can just get that little bit of extra practice, which is honestly one of the reasons why I continue to do this. Even though I've got a whole bunch of different options of machinery and whatnot and joinery methods, I still love doing this because it allows me just to get that little bit of extra practice with half line dovetails just on almost every project I do, even if I'm only doing these four small joints, it's just that little bit of practice time and time again that helps me not get rusty with my dovetails.
Then with the whole structure together, we can start putting in those cross pieces on each of the frames. So this is pretty easy, just mortise and tenon in. Uh, again, like I mentioned before, these frames need to come out pretty accurately flat when I put them all together later on. So I really took my time tuning up the joinery and made sure to go through and adjust each tenon individually so that when I put them into the mortise, everything came out perfectly flat. To add some detail to our vertically oriented stretchers, I went through and added a curve. So we actually have three of these stretchers that have these curves in them, uh, the bottom stretchers on both the front and back, as well as the middle stretcher on the front. Now, what's really interesting about this is I wanted to try something new, and that is using a curved drawer front. So because we have that curvature in that stretcher, we're gonna be matching the drawer front to that curve. And this is one of the things I've really wanted to try for a long time, and I couldn't figure out a good way to do it until I got this little handy tool right here, this Stanley number 113 compass plane. Because the whole purpose of this hand plane is to cut very accurate curves, and it allows you to dial in the curve just the perfect arc every single time. So once I got this tool, I knew that I was gonna be able to make those drawer fronts to perfectly fit into matching stretchers. But this is also just a super fun tool to use, and I'll take any excuse I can get to put it to use in a project. So now we can actually start the finishing stage. So this is a really important part of working with stained wood, is that you really need to take your time during the finishing stages to do as good of a job as you can. So my finishing process that I used on this project is that I started by going through and hand planing as many of the surfaces as I can. Since I first started buying these older Stanley style planes, uh, they have genuinely changed the way that I look at hand planes. They're a far more useful tool now. Uh, it's nothing against my low angle jack, but I definitely prefer these older Stanleys. There's just something about them that make them work so beautifully and they're so comfortable to use too. Then with the frames all cleaned up, I can throw them into the lead jig and this will help me cut a very accurate half inch wide groove that will be stopped about one inch from the front of the frame and this will eventually hold our divider panels that will then separate our drawers. Now I feel like it's important to mention because you just saw me use a thousand dollar jig in order to cut these grooves, that's not the only way to do it. Within woodworking, there's usually a hundred different ways to do the same task and it's all about doing your own research and finding a way that's going to work best for you and the tools that you have. With the divider panels, this is where you really have to consider how wood movement is going to affect these pieces. So for both of the level of drawers that I'm doing here, our pieces are under six inches wide, which means that they're in no way are they ever going to expand or contract enough to cause issues with our drawers. So in this specific case, I can easily make these divider panels using that horizontally oriented grain and then just gluing a piece to that front edge. And this makes it a very easy to fit up these panels. But if you're dealing with drawers that are let's say eight or 10 inches tall, you do have to be a little bit more weary of what the wood movement is gonna do to those middle pieces. So in that case, you'd have to use fully ver vertically oriented grain throughout that whole panel to make sure that that's not going to damage or affect your drawers later on. But again, in this case, we're gonna be just fine because neither of these side panels are going to expand or contract enough in order to cause issues. To attach our front pieces, I'm just gonna be using some nice simple dowels. This is gonna allow for plenty of wood movement because we're only gonna be attaching it to two points fairly close to the center of each of these boards. That way, each of these pieces has all the room for wood movement that they're gonna need. We can then flush everything up and then we now have perfectly fitted panels that really took no time whatsoever to make. Now, this is one of the most important things to do anytime you're building a dresser with frames. Make sure you run around that inside edge with a chamfer bit just to break that sharp edge. Getting back to our panels here, we're, once the whole dresser put together now, we can slide them in. And as you can see that that front edge of that maple piece is sticking way past our frames. So what we're gonna do is just sneak up on that using the shooting board and my low angle jack. This let me get that front piece to the absolutely perfect width so that it was sitting exactly where I needed it to be in comparison to those frames. Then we're on to the finishing stages. Now, this is one of the things that has really impressed me about working with stain recently, is that it takes so much more work to make a good looking project that has been stained compared to doing a good looking project that's just made out of natural wood. Because with natural wood, there are things you can get away with. Whereas when you, as soon as you apply stain to a piece of wood, it is gonna instantly highlight any issues that are, might be in the wood. So it's really important to take your time and do a good job of your finishing process. For the staining here, I talked about before how this is a new process, and the biggest thing here is using this dye stain. 
Now there will be a comprehensive video about this whole staining process coming out next weekend, so make sure you guys are subscribed for that. But I will say that using this dye stain is genuinely the secret to getting a good quality stain on really any wood. Again, remember here, I'm working with hard maple. This is one of the most difficult woods to stain nicely because it's just so dense. But I, got, I was able to get this really beautiful, rich, dark brown color that I did not think was possible. If you'd shown me this piece of furniture a month ago, before I'd started doing some experimenting with this dye stain, I would have never believed that the base wood was hard maple. Then to just increase the richness and deepness of the color here, I'm top coating this with some gel stain. These two stains in combination just help bring such a beautiful, rich color to the wood. Again, something that I didn't think was possible, but I'm very excited to use in a lot of upcoming projects here. Because one of the things that I've found with staining is this kind of unlocks a whole new potential with woodworking. Because one of the problems I've run into a lot in the past is that there's only so many different natural colors of wood, and especially natural colors of wood that I can actually get. But this idea of being able to stain a wood like maple or ash, or really doesn't matter, uh, to perfectly match whatever natural wood I want to work with, like this cherry for example, I think is just such an awesome creative freedom that I now have. With the main structure all finished and ready to be glued up, we can actually move on to the tabletop, doors, and cabinet base. So all of these pieces are basically a simple frame and panel construction. We're going to be doing some different stuff with slats and solid panels and whatnot, but overall all three of these items are the exact same thing. So to start us off here, you can see we're just going through and milling all of the pieces basically to the same standard. with a few different sizes here and there depending on which component they're going to be a part of, but for the most part it's a very simple process of just cutting some grooves. Now as we focus in on the doors here, I actually decided to use some dowel joinery to reinforce my pieces. Because the big problem that I knew I was going to have is I have to go through and pre-finish each of these pieces before I can glue them up. So the main reason these dowels are here is to help alignment later on. So once we've gone through that whole staining process and everything is ready to be glued up, these dowels are meant to sit perfectly in their mating holes to then help that piece sit perfectly square. Because the other problem that I knew I was going to have with these doors is that there was no way I was going to be able to adjust them after the, everything was done. And once they were glued up, they were going to have to be mounted in the cabinet that same way because there would be no way I could hand plane them to fit. So this was a very stressful moment when I realized this with the doors because it then meant that these doors had to come out absolutely perfect. Now in hindsight, what I would do with these doors is I would do them the same way I've done on past projects where I've dealt with staining and I would build the door you know, the same way I normally would, but I would make sure that the panel was removable. That would allow me to build the door, fit it up, do all that kind of good stuff, and then go through and mount the panel in after everything has been stained. That would be a much more logical approach. This idea that I went with here of trying to build an absolutely perfect door right off the bat, well, it was pretty cool and the doors did work out perfectly in the end, it did increase the amount of stress severely. On the other hand, the cabinet base panel as well as the tabletop were both super simple. They were very straightforward with just some normal mortise and tenon joinery, so there was really no stress involved in there. So it was very funny kind of seeing the differences here. But again, similar to the rest of this project, I knew that there would be no way to adjust these things later on. And one of the areas where I almost tripped up is I almost made the base panel for the cabinet just a little bit too big, which then would have meant having to go through and make adjustments later on. So luckily at this stage, I was able to go through and check that this frame actually fit into the structure that we already had. Then onto our floating panels, I decided for the doors I wanted to have this book matched pair that would look really cool because anytime you have two doors that are side by side, I think it's just the perfect opportunity to do some book matching. As well as for the tabletop, I decided to go with two slats for each individual section. So the tabletop is broken into two sections and then each of those sections is broken into two slats that are then book matched. This just helps bring in some cool visual interest and whatnot and I think it's just a good excuse to do some book matching. If you've been following me for any amount of time, you know that I'm a huge fan of book matching and I use it at any point I could possibly get. Purely because it's one of those details that I think it's, it's, it is quite challenging to get right, but when you do get it right, it does make a massive difference. And I think, I think even non-woodworkers do notice it. For the cabinet base panel, I had this leftover piece that I used for making the slats on the side structure. 
but rather than breaking it down into slats like I did on the sides, I decided to keep it in its solid form, that way it would match the doors. Because one of the hardest things I had to decide with this project was what to do with my panels. Because on the sides, I really liked the way that those panels came out with those different slats and having the grooves and whatnot in there. I think that, that looked really good. But when it came to the doors and especially this cabinet panel, I, I didn't like the look of those slats. I thought that they made it a little bit too busy. Plus, especially on the doors, they didn't match up with what the drawer fronts were gonna look like. So that was where I was really excited that I was able to do this solid panel very easily with that, that bottom cabinet panel. And yeah, just I'm really happy that it came out looking as good as it did and I think it worked out quite well. Now one of the things that's very important to notice about all the cherry pieces I'm using on this project is that I'm using spline joints rather than tongue and groove. The problem that I've run into in the past with tongue and groove is that your math becomes a little bit more complex because you have to account for the width of those tenons, uh, you have to account for the, the depths of your groove, all that kind of stuff. Whereas when you use a spline joint, it ends up making both sides of your pieces the exact same, which then makes it easier to put on bevels and do your finishing and whatnot. It overall just makes the process easier. And then it means that all you have to do is just drop your spline in place and you have the exact same strength of a tongue and groove piece without actually having to go through all the complexity of creating that tongue and groove piece. So overall, it's just an easier process of doing the exact same thing as tongue and groove joinery. It just makes it a little bit easier on yourself and it allows for a little bit of extra adjustability here and there. With all those components ready to go, we can move on to the next stage of staining. Now, the really interesting thing about this staining process is that it kind of has to take place over three days. In order to allow all of the different levels of staining and finishing and whatnot to fully cure up, it does take a decent amount of time, but it is well worth it. Now, I thought this was going to end up causing issues by pushing certain parts of the project back, but I was actually able to kind of put things in a really good order. So while the stain was drying on those other components, I was able to do the primary glue up for the main structure here. And the nice thing about this is I was actually in a pretty relaxed mood. Even though I was very stressed about doing this, I knew that there was gonna be plenty of time for me to get everything together. And I knew that because I'd taken all that time with my joinery, I really shouldn't have a major issue. But again, I was very methodical. You can see here that I'm actually moving fairly slow, a lot slower than I typically move when I'm doing a glue up because I don't want to mess anything up because the thing with the glue up on a project like this is that there's no, you can't make a mistake. There is no option to go back and fix things. You can't sand in case you get a little bit of glue to squeeze out. You have to do it perfectly on the first try. And so knowing that I was kind of stressed out, but I was doing everything I could to keep myself as calm as possible. The only moment of the glue up where I started to get really stressed out was when I was trying to attach the second side. So this first part here where I'm just matching the tenons and all that, getting everything put in place, this is easy. But when we've got all of those individual tenons poking out and then we have to try and get that other side attached, plus we've got that downside of if any glue drips out, it's going to be a pain in the butt to clean up. You know, everything here has to come together perfectly. Now, I'm actually kind of surprised at how well this glue up went given how much, you know, how much could have gone wrong. But the areas where there was a little bit of glue squeeze out, I was able to easily wipe it away with some water without damaging the finish. And all of the components went together really well. And I think that this is all to do with the fact that I took that time to really focus on my joinery and try and put things together as well as I possibly could. So by taking that time initially to really focus in on my joinery and do as good of a job as I possibly could, it actually ended up making the whole project easier going forward. So that's definitely something that I'm gonna learn from this project and take into my future ones. Now, as we get into doing the drawers here, I have to say that I absolutely hate doing drawers. I, I love them because of how functional they are. Like having drawers on a piece of furniture really just steps up the amount of usefulness because you can store a lot of stuff in them, they're great. But they do take a ton of time and effort. So when I was planning out how to do these drawers, I had all these different ideas of, of ways that I could kind of go about making it easier on myself. For one, I've got the option of that lead jig. So I could use you know variable dovetails, I could use box joints, I could do a lot of different things that would make this easier on myself. But with all of those options in front of me, I decided that I'd take the old school route and hand cut all of my dovetails. Now, I, I it's not that I regret that doing that, it was just that it was a lot more work than I was anticipating. It was a decent amount of fun and I'm actually really glad to see how they came out. It was a good amount of practice because it's been a while since I've had to hand cut that many dovetails, but I will say that I don't quite know if the effort was truly worth it. 
But anyway, moving back to the drawer front here, this top drawer front is the one that is really the only room that's any excitement to it, uh, because this is the one we're having to put that curvature on. So trying to match this curve actually was a very easy thing to do. I was so stressed that I was gonna have to remake this drawer front multiple times. I was, I was banking on the fact that it was probably gonna take me two or three tries to actually get this drawer front right. But again, because I have that wonderful tool, that Stanley number 113 uh, compass plane, that just let me absolutely dial in this perfect curve that then matched the perfect curve that I had on those stretchers. So this is one of those tools. If you are someone that likes to do curves in your furniture, I highly recommend hopping on eBay and just keeping your eye out for one of these tools. You can also find them on your local Facebook marketplace, Kijiji, whatever. They are one of the most wonderful tools you will ever buy for your shop. Again, if you like doing anything with curves. And so moving back to the dovetails, the thing that I find so funny about hand cutting dovetails is this first portion where you're just going through and you're cutting the tail boards, this is actually the funnest, most enjoyable and easiest part of doing the dovetails because it really is not hard. You're just having to hold yourself at a little bit of an angle and then you're just chiseling out a little bit of material. It's actually really fun and easy. So you kind of start off doing your dovetail work in a really good spirit. And you'll notice on all these boards, I actually went through and added a small rabbit. This is just gonna help with alignment later on. I do have that lead jig that I use for alignment on my dovetails, but this, this small rabbit does make it a little bit easier and a little bit faster. Plus it means there's a little bit less material to remove on the socket portion of the dovetails. Where dovetails start to get a little bit tedious is when you get onto that socket portion. So for through dovetails, it's really not that bad. You know, you can smash out some through dovetails in a matter of minutes, they're not hard. But because I wanted to use half line dovetails in my drawer fronts, it took a lot more time and effort. Even though I used a router and all that to kind of cheat my way through doing those half line dovetails, it, it took a lot of time. And this is one of those things that I've been kind of finding out about myself, and I've known this for a little while. Uh, when it comes to drawer joinery, I like to go with something, or I prefer to go with something that is a little bit faster and less tedious, you know, something that I can kind of just get done, which is why I've really been enjoying using box joints lately. But every once in a while, I do think that it is good to slow down and do some of this hand cut joinery. It's really a case of when you have every option at your disposal, sometimes it's great to take that fast and efficient method and just kind of get stuff done really quickly. But other times it's good to just remind yourself of the amount of work that actually has to go into some of these pieces by just slowing down doing that hand cut joinery and really just taking the time to appreciate how much effort can go into a piece of furniture like this. Now, will I be hand cutting my dovetails on the next few projects? Honestly, I don't know, because one of the things that I found really is it makes it a little bit more interesting is on each project I do, I kind of just let how I'm feeling at the time decide how I want to do that joinery. You know, sometimes I might design a project specifically around using box joints, and in that case, I will only use box joints, but I like to kind of just leave that open, let myself make the decision at that time, because I do think that that is part of the creative process. You can really, when you see that piece of furniture sitting in your shop, you can kind of choose what method you think is gonna work the best. You can see here, the drawers do come together. Again, some of these dovetails came together just beautifully. Other ones were a little bit on the loose side, but overall with a little bit of glue, all the drawers came together just wonderfully. And I do think that those half line dovetails on the fronts do look really, really cool. Now I will admit I did make a small mistake when I was making these drawers in that I didn't make it so that I could actually make the drawer bottoms removable. Because on the top three drawers, I ended up making them with just a single dovetail, which meant that if I removed the bottom edge of the back piece, there wouldn't have actually been anything holding the dovetail in place. So I ended up just making all of the drawer bottoms fixed in place, and this usually isn't the best practice, and I think this is actually the first time I've done this, but it is one of those things where it was really my only option. But I'm also using quarter inch plywood here, which is going to be plenty strong enough. And these drawers are small enough where if I, even if I'm holding my gold bar collection in there, I really should not have to worry about those drawer bottoms breaking. So is it a little bit of a compromise? Yes. Is it really that big of a deal? No. I Again, I'm not super concerned about those drawer bottoms getting broken. And if they ever do, it's just a matter of remaking a drawer, which is not exactly a thing that I'm afraid to do because, well, it doesn't take that much work for being honest. When it came time to fit up the drawers, this was a super easy thing to do, honestly. There's really not much to share about this. All it took was removing just a little bit of material because I took the time when I was making the drawers to make sure that they were a fairly close fit. So when it came time to get that nice precision fit so the drawer was sliding in and out, it was just a matter of removing that little bit of material. 
For the back panel, we're gonna be using some hardboard. Now, I got crap in the comment section in the last video, how dare you use hardboard on the back of a thing? And what I will say to that is that at this point in time, I am currently broke. And so if I can not use, you know, $20 or $30 worth of hardwood for that back panel, and instead I can use a 50 cent piece of hardboard, I'm gonna do it because at this point in time, that's a good compromise to make. But that's also a very important point to make is that this is a compromise. If I was building this piece of furniture with the budget that I would love to have for it, of course I would take the time to make a nice looking back panel. But this is one of those things, certain compromises have to be made and this is a good area to kind of save yourself a little bit of money. Again, doing a solid hardwood back panel, you know, whether you do it like tongue and groove, slat structure, whatever, however you want to do it, right? That can get fairly expensive and has a lot of processing time involved in it. Whereas when you just slap on a piece of hardboard, that makes it very, very easy. With that back panel in place, I did some quick adjustments to my drawers, just making sure that they were all sitting the same depth in from that front edge. And then it was just a matter of doing the final finishing touches on the drawers, getting them fully sanded up, oiled, and all ready to go. The final step here was mounting up the doors. Now this, this is the single most stressful and heartbreaking portion of this entire project for about 30 seconds. Because what happened when I first mounted the doors is that they were way off of the proper angle. So in the middle, the door on the left hand side was way too low by about a 16th of an inch. And on the door on the right here that you're seeing, it was about a 16th of an inch too high. But luckily I would concluded a little bit of leeway here and all I had to do to fix this was just go through on these hinge spacer pieces and just taper them ever so slightly. This helped me bring my doors back into square. Now my first thought is that I'd screwed up something in the glue up of the doors. For some reason I hadn't glued them up as square as I thought I had. But when I checked them, they were pretty square. What I realized had happened is that the whole cabinet section was just a little bit out of square. And it's that little bit that then when you pass that through the doors and get that lined up in the middle, that we end up with that major error in there. So I'm glad to say that I did leave that adjustability in there and it did save my butt. It was a little bit of a stressful moment, but I'm very excited that I was able to get things all tuned up so that the doors were sitting perfectly in line with each other. So with the addition of this little magnetic stop, the project is now completed. So I do hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you wanna see more projects like this, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe down below. But as always guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.